For the record, we're interviewing Mr. Lambert Wazier Jr. for the Midlow Center on July 11, 2016. Mr. Wazier, do you give your approval for this interview? Yes. Would you please state your full name? Lambert Charles Wazier Jr. When and where were you born? New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, June 2nd, 1943. 43. Where were you born? Terry Hospital? Uh, Flint Goodrich. Flint Goodrich. Okay. Flint, yeah. So you were Flint baby. Yeah. Where did you grow up? St. Peter Claver Parish, Prairie and Dumaine, uh, North Prairie and Dumaine. So you were six water. Six water. That's Not right. For, for whatever reason, I thought seven you were seven water. water. No, married girl from seven water. Okay. And um, my family, my mother was from the six water. Okay. She grew up on Gallus and St. Anne. My daddy came from Jones School. Um, his mother was custodian. Okay. So he was from the Seven Ward. And um, when they got married, they lived on Dumaine and Prairie. We stayed at, from, if I can remember, from 1949. I might have been a little earlier than that. Uh, my grandmother lived on Dumaine Street, okay. around the corner. <coughs> and um, lived, they went to St. Peter Clay for uh, first through eight, all the bar. Okay. Yeah. And uh, some people thought I was going to become a priest. Ray Dagan was an altar boy there. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's Peter Bear. Right? Yeah. He's young, younger than me, much younger than I am. Yeah. And um, some of the priests at St. Peter Clever were my teachers at St. Hall. Okay. Yeah. So later on, when I went to, I went to Peter Clever at St. Hall. So, <clears throat> what kind of work did your parents do? Well, my father was an embalmer. In 1954, he bought the funeral home, Carr and Little Peace Funeral Home. I remember on Main Street. Little Peace. And, um, my mother was a housewife, by the way. She worked in El Trellis, uh, tobacco, okay. cigarette, but younger when she was young, but after that she was a housewife. That was a pretty good job at one yeah, time. That's right. That's where all the girls worked with. Yeah, cigarette. Yeah. And um, so I grew up in the funeral business, and it wasn't but a few blocks from the house. Right. So uh, I'd run back and forth as a kid, you know, and um, picked up what I considered business practices from a young age. And my dad used to make me make the payroll and do the banking, uh, which affected me later on because I, I wasn't afraid to go to a bank. Right. You know? And uh, even when I got married, I made a loan at the bank as opposed to financing furniture through the, you know, uh, loan sharks. You know? Right. So I um, picked up banking habits there, business practices, um, started working around the funeral home, cleaning up, fixing the chairs. And uh, Mrs. Lopez, who previously owned the funeral home, when my daddy bought the business, gave myself and my brother the Coke machine hmm. so we could make money selling Cokes at, at wakes and funerals. And our responsibility was to order the Cokes, supply them, fill the machine up, count the money and all that. So it, as a kid, we were kind of in the business. And um, from there, I just grew up in that, and from the funeral home. Um, now, what was the funeral home opposite to you? you were, Chauvinet. Chauvinet. But it was uh, St. Philip. St. Philip. You were on we went to Mang, and he was on St. Philip. And it was that time it was Labatt. Right. The Emile Labatt funeral home. Right. Uh, Chauvinet married into the Labatt family, and right. then later on they made it Labatt Chauvinet. So, were you kin to the Lopez? No, um, my father just bought the business from them. So okay. They were, they were, the madam, as we used to call, it, was. Uh, like a family member in a sense. Okay. She wanted to sell to him. Uh, so he bought the business in 54, 50, midnight 55, something like that. And then bought the building around 57. Okay. Um, and I grew up in the business. Are there any of them left? No. Um, all of them have passed. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I grew up in the funeral business and and the record was preparing me for politics. I didn't know it. Really? Oh. You know, because I was mingling with families. Okay. I was in every church right. in the city just about the so funeral. You learned how to talk to people. Learned, talk to the ministers, talk to the family, and always learned that the families were right, the customer was right. And you still and, had a lot of house, house wakes at that time. Oh, yeah. You see, you were in the houses. But you, you, I grew up servicing people. Right. And wanting to serve. So it was a natural for me, you know, when I got into politics to want to help people. I grew up that way. Okay. Um, and then by going in all the churches, I built up a network of people, not knowing I was going to use it later on, but uh, developed a relationship with ministers, with priests. So you weren't just in Six Falls, you were all over the city? All over the city. Okay. And uh, the funeral home, the car in Low Peace, the car was from uptown New Orleans, Low Peace was from downtown. So they had business kind of grew drew from both sides of Canal Street. Right. Like uh, Blandin, well Blandin was citywide too. Some of the funeral homes were kind of local, 
you know, say it was a bottomless primary, like seven or what have you. But um, it allowed me to go back and forth, learn the city very well, knew all the neighborhoods, um, met with insurance companies and understood insurance, health insurance, life insurance, barrel insurance, got to understand all of that. These were things I was learning and not knowing I'd use it later on, but right. it, it all helped me. Um, then uh, from there we went, um, I went to St. Hall. Right. Um, so who had influence over you at St. Hall? Well, we had Father Grant. Okay. Um, O'Rook, the oh, chief. Uh, Father um, Gardner, who uh, was also a priest at Peter Papers from time to time and taught there. Um, Father Mack. I was waiting because everybody yeah, mentioned Father, Father Mack. Mack. Uh, he was tough. He taught us a little bit about politics. He taught us about, but at that time, we couldn't, we weren't even registered. Right. And then. Um, he taught me how to fill out the registration right, form. Right, and taught us how to vote in that large race. Yeah. We had to vote for two. Yeah. And uh, didn't, again, not knowing what you're going to do in life, you know. I tell it to kids when I go back and talk to them and say, no, that we were there, we were learning things that didn't know what we were going to use it for, you know, but it was very helpful. The priests were, were very good teachers. Yeah. I mean, just well round, give you a well rounded education. So, um, Father Berrigan, right. Philip Berrigan. Father Verrett. Father Verrett, yeah. I, I had read for one class, I think. Okay. Um, Berrigan, when I finished from St. Louis, when I was finishing from St. Louis, he called me and he said, You're an amazing student. I said, Well, thank you, Father. He said, No, wait a minute. He said, What's amazing is that you came here, you went on a roll every six weeks. Second year, every other six weeks. Uh -oh. Third year, one six week. Fourth year, we're not sure if you're going to finish. <laughs> <laughs> so you had he that going forward he said, in business? He said, that's amazing. He said, but he said, I think you, you, you're material for Holy Cross College. Uh -huh. I said, well, I can't go to Holy Cross. You know, back then, Boston was kind of hot you yeah. know, in the early 60s, 59, yeah. 60, like that. And... Um, my parents couldn't afford the tuition, you know. And I said, nah, another four years with all these priests and all these boys. I said, I don't think I can make that far. He said, I can get you one year scholarship. I said, I don't think so. I said, I, I, I'm going to pass on. So I let it go. Well, years later, working at the Urban League, I'm in Boston. Right. And I asked the young lady, she was showing us around. I said, show me Holy Cross. Man, when I saw that campus, what you I said, see? why didn't I come up here, you know? I would have been a, you never know what happened from there. Right. But uh, had good experiences at St. Aug. Um, and at St. Aug, they were high on math and science. Right. I was prone to be more business. So I'd go to Straits Business School in the summer. Did you? Okay. Yeah, and I'd take up some business courses oh, wow. and all that. Um, and I was, that was the only thing I was, uh, thought St. Aug lacking. They didn't teach us the business. Okay. They were, they were trying to push us into what they considered better white collar jobs, in a sense. Um, so I had to kind of separate my time and, and um, I really wanted to be in business. And then since I didn't go to Holy Cross, I came over here to UNO. Right. And um, I stayed there for a year or so. And then I went to mortuary school in Houston, Texas, Commonwealth College. So by that time you had decided you were going to go into family business? Well, when I looked at the possibilities then, if you remember, you could be a school teacher. Postal work. You could go to post office. <laughs> um, military. Um, and if you had a little business, go back in your family business. So yeah. I'd say, well, the amount of money you're paying teachers and this, I could do that in my family business. So I decided, I worked one summer in a charity hospital um, and it helped uh, dog room developing x-rays. And then I went to uh, Mortuary College in Houston, Texas. How long were you there? A year. Louis Charbonnet went a year before me. Okay. Louis married my first cousin, Simone. Okay. So as he was coming out, I went and moved in the same apartment they had and um, went to school, same school. So it was a good So he was what, two years ahead of you? He was a year ahead of me in, in the funeral business. No, I mean at St. Aug. At St. Aug, he was about two years ahead okay. of me. And um, so then I went to Houston, Texas, and uh, stayed that year a few months and came back home. Did you detect any differences between Houston and New Orleans at that time? Was oh, yeah. Yeah, big Early difference. Early 60s? Yeah, big difference. Uh, Houston was, was growing fast then. Yeah. Had a lot of apartment complexes. New Orleans didn't have too much of that. Right. They have smaller complexes, full plexes, doubles, mostly right. doubles, especially six and seven ward. That was right. You didn't see too many apartments, you right. know. 
uh, when I went to Houston, uh, the first day I lived in a, a complex, about six, six or eight units, I think it was, in the middle of an area called Sugar Hill, almost like Gentile. Yeah. In a few blocks from Texas Southern. Okay, that's what it is. Um, and I lived off uh, Rosewood and, um, let's see, it was Rosewood, Delano. Oh, I know what it is. Yeah. I know where it is. Uh, Darling. Yes. Indeed. On the corner of it was uh, that club. I saw Lou Ross. TSU and UH. And, TSU. And UH was in right. the same uh, vicinity. Same vicinity, that's right. And um, Groovy Girl, Girl Ball and uh, Till Webster and uh, Blodgett. I think it's still there. Yeah, I think so. And um, from. Um, from there, I came back home. But okay. living in Houston was different from New Orleans. Okay. Frenchie's had a little place. I think he sold fried chicken or something. He was from South Louisiana. Okay. But for the most part, the food was different. The neighborhoods were different. Apartment complex living was totally different. We didn't have that here. Right. And um, there must be some apprenticeship out there, some of the funeral homes. And um, learned to travel a little bit. I-10 wasn't completed. Right. Uh, we drove uh, from Houston to Louisiana State Line, and we had to switch over. And uh, the school, in Marchwater School, I had a um, assist on the behind, and I missed a couple of classes. Mm. I had to have a little minor surgery. So to make up for it, um, the dean uh, told me I was doing well in school. He put me on uh, with one of his instructors. I had to take it through South Louisiana, coming to New Orleans. So he could sell the funeral supplies. Wow. So I had the chance to drive in and out of Louisiana from Houston to New Orleans, and uh, he, that, he excused me from the from the midterms, going to New Orleans. When I came back, he said, "You got to make up that time." I said, "But you sent me." He said, "But you were out." So he made me teach. Uh -huh. But in teaching, I was learning. It helped me become right. a better uh, student. In a I sense. agree with that. So I was able to take the national exam, pass my test, came back to Louisiana as a licensed mortician, the funeral director. Did you find race relations were a little progressive in Houston and the other uh, here? Didn't feel it too much. Didn't feel it. Didn't feel it. We, we lived in a, you know, decent neighborhood. Okay. Um, we went to a small school, trade school, and we didn't have too much interaction with um, outside of that little class of people that we were dealing with. I don't ever remember having any racial problems or any police problems. Okay. Um, we, we were the problems, you know, being in school and drinking and gang and all and stuff like that. But nothing serious. Yourself. Yeah, nothing serious. But a little bit of New Orleans and Houston. That's right. Went to Frenchies and stuff like Did that. Did you remember having any serious racial problems growing up? No. Um, a little minor things I consider minor. Um, I remember going to the store, and I can't think of the name of it right now, but I bought a um, Pendleton shirt jacket, and the salesman wouldn't wait on me. Hmm. And they kept passing me up and passing me up. I'm going to think of the name of the store. But anyway, so I said, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk out the store. And as I walked toward the door, they came to, to hmm. service me. But I felt that they didn't want to service me because I was black. Yeah. You know, um, I remember the colored fountains. Mm -hmm. um, my brother's fair skin, so we go to Dairy Queen and had colored and white, and he'd say, well, I'm going to hit the white, and you go to the color. You remember those little distinctions right. then? I remember some incidents with the police uh, coming from UNO, had old DeSoto, and uh, Charlie Cott, myself, Leonard Wilson, a couple other guys who come from UNO. And I came down the feet Feet Street. Police had a barricade at Galvis near the feet, and we were on the feet crossing Galvis. And when he looked up and saw four or five blacks in the car, midday, 12, 1 o'clock, he said, That's it. He told him, Watch this. And he said, Y'all pull on the side. So what's the problem? He said, Get out. What, what y'all doing? Where, where y'all coming from? What you doing? So you're coming from school. What school? You, you don't go to UNO. You know. And which one of y'all got a knife? He said, hmm. No, no. Yeah, somebody's got a knife. Um, he said, open up the trunk. I said, well, let me explain something to you. I said, the lock on the, the trunk is very difficult to open. I'm going to have to play with it a little bit. He said, you're going to open that trunk. I said, all I got in there is fishing nets, crab nets. He said, open the trunk. 
So I, I nervously got the trunk open. Yeah. And he said, you got nothing but fishing. I said, I said, I told you. That's all I had to begin with. Get the hell out. Get, get out the hell out of here. Hmm. Uh, another incident we had was when um, at night, 9, 10 o'clock at night, we were going up on LaSalle around the Dew Drop Inn. Oh, yeah. And uh, police stopped us. Four or five of us in the car, pulled us on the side, and said, uh, "Y'all speed." I said, "I didn't think I was speeding." Yeah, y'all speed. How much money y'all got? I said, what you mean? How much money? I said, "I got two hundred dollars." I got ten. I got give me money. Took our money, and let us go. But mm. we we gladly gave up the money, right? As opposed to being dragged down for some foolishness. Right, even know? though you know you were not That's wrong. Right. Yeah. But you remember the frost stop on Broad Street? That wouldn't yeah. save you out of uh, the mug. Yeah, yeah. Now that you mentioned that, I forgot yeah. about the frost stop. Okay. Yeah, but um, other than that, I don't remember too many things. I didn't have, you know, a lot of contact in, um, well, we, we started the, the marches and sit-ins right. later on, but that was more around the time we got to college. I yeah, we were here at UNO, right. Pickerton on Canal Street. But prior to that, my, my, again, I was mostly in the business with my father. So we didn't have, you know, we didn't bury blacks, and we had some relationship with black white undertakers, right. you know. But I never had a problem in any particular area, uh, other than the fact that we knew we couldn't go certain places. But you didn't have any black banks at that time? No. Liberty Bank, matter of fact, the first black bank was, I dealt with was Riverside in Houston, Texas. Okay. And that was in 60, around 62, 63, something okay. like that. I'm trying to think, United Federal must have opened about the mid-60s. About that, mid-late 60s. I don't remember when Corpus Christi Credit Union opened. That was around before then. Okay. Yeah, the credit union was there before, I think, United Federal. Um, around the same time. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Thank you. Uh, I got my first house from United, finance from United Federal. Okay. I had um, houses for sale. and. Um, my, my wife, she used to do hair, and she found out from one of the customers that the house was for sale. So, 10 o'clock at night, we were coming from the shop, we ride on Parker Street. She said, that's got to be the house. I said, well, there's no sign on it. She said, that's got to be the house. Said, where, where was it located? On Parker between Hope and Dues. Oh, yeah. Around Epiphany. Around Epiphany. Yeah, so uh, she got out the car, knocked on the door, and uh, the guy said, yeah, it was for sale, and he let us in to look at it. Tell about it. I was going to say yeah. that. And, uh, Different but she, she grew up in the neighborhood. Okay. And her relatives were carpenters and brick masons, so they're all tradesmen. Right. So this guy was a carpenter, so he knew her family. Okay. So he let us in, and uh, he had an offer already in. But I told him if that offer didn't go through, give me a chance to put a bid in. So uh, a couple of weeks later, he called back and said it didn't go through, so I went to United Federal. And at that time, United Federal was having, all banks were having cash flow problems. So they had lines of people to get, he went in line to get a loan. So I went in, the loan he had on the house was at United Federal. Okay. And he was like four or five months late. So I went in and saw Mr. Williams, and um, he said, well, Lambert, you got to get in line. He said, I got about 30 people ahead of you. I said, Mr. Williams, I said, you got to do this loan. He said, well, I, you, I can't. I said, look, I said, you already got a bad loan on the books. Right. You loaned me the money. I'm going to make a bad loan, a good loan, and you're not loaning me but $2,500 more than what's on the books. Right. I said, so you got to move me up to the top of the line. He said, well, I guess you're right. So I didn't look at it that way. <laughs> yeah. That's what I said, I'll look at it. <laughs> he was able to step me up, make the loan, and uh, I was short a few dollars with the down payment, and the, the owner's father died. So I made a deal with Barry, his father, at the funeral home <laughs> to offset my dollar wow, bill. Wow, yeah. Wow. yeah, so it worked out pretty good. Uh, he got the sale, I got the funeral, I got the house. <laughs> so it worked out all right. But, um, and I always dealt with Corpus Christi yeah. from a kid, you know. Um, my wife's mother was a big uh, supporter of the credit union. She would save money there for the kids and everybody else. So we had a good relationship with the credit union. And I'd refinance every couple of years, you know. Um, that's how I, to avoid, uh, loan companies. Right. I did everything through banks and credit unions, you know. Again, from being on the business side. And when I carried it into politics, I was already frustrated because I had the, my business approach was different than the political approach. Right. And when you try to bring the two together, it's kind of difficult. And eventually I realized that even though they talk about making government look like business, 
you really can't do it, no. but you can get kind. You can pick up some of <clears> the <throat> practices to make it a little bit more efficient. Um, but the efficiencies in business almost contradict the services of government. Because to be efficient, you got to let people off. Right. Uh, in government, you try to keep people employed. You right. don't want to have uh, unemployment. And right. You're not you're supposed to be making a profit anyway. That's right. You're not supposed to make a profit. So, uh, I was kind of frustrated being in the legislative branch of government, knowing that some things they were doing could be managed a little bit better. But I, you know, I brought all those things to the table, and I mention that because when you're making decisions and you got to vote, all that has to cross your mind. Right. And I tell people all the time, as black legislators, we have to think what impact it has on our people first, and then we look at how it works in government, whereas other legislators just vote because that's that impact them differently. What was one of the toughest votes you had to make? Um, I'm trying to think what the toughest vote I had. I think all of them were, were my, I don't remember anything being real. I had a real difficult zoning issue okay. on Park Chester. Um, the developer purchased the land from HUD. Right. And uh, there was multifamily units on it. But Brad Baggett, who preceded me had down zone it to single family. And the developer wanted to move it from single family back to multifamily. But the neighborhood had changed in those years right. and it, it wasn't ready for multifamily. And uh, even Clancy Dubos wrote, wrote an article saying this could be my Achilles heel, depending on what happened with, with Paris Oaks. And I was really jammed on that vote. Okay. Um, when, when it came up, I had a, a cousin of mine about marriage who had done some work in D.C. and I asked him to look at the project for me and tell me what would work better at that corner. And he came over here to Dr. Riggs and met with oh, Ray yeah, Riggs. Ray and uh, we had told him, well, your cousin's going to be in the bind because the developer's going to have the mayor and the council members and he's going to get what he wants in zoning. Um, so he's not going to be able to do what he wants to do. And what the developer is proposing is not the best thing for that site. Um, and it would be better to have townhouses as opposed to um, multifamily and um, a low number. So we came back and told me that. And I said, oh, I'm going to have my four votes. You know, I'm going to stop this guy from doing what he wants to do. And we're going to put in nice, decent housing. Well, that's like six months. Passed, and here comes the zoning petition. Okay. And that night before I went back, looked over Wade Riggers' notes and to show how what he was proposing wouldn't work and that a better quality product would work. So when I got to the council chambers, I went to Sydney first, and the, his girl told me, Oh, Sydney's acting mad today. <laughs> so he couldn't vote. So he couldn't vote. <laughs> so then I went to uh, Mike Early, his seatmate. Right. He's a lamb. I got him over to the developer. He said, uh, he helped my wife and all of that. So I said, well, then I went to Brian Wagner, and Brian reminded me that a couple of weeks earlier I voted with the developer over him, and he had to vote with the developer in this case. Then I went to Babovich, who was on the council at the time, and he said, well, you voted for Rudy Barnes. Against me, I got to vote with this guy. So I and I knew Jim and Jerusa were going to be tied to the developer. Yeah. So I had no votes. No. And then, then the flashback was, <laughs> yeah, we, had Regis, we had Rager said, your cousin's going to be in the bind. Yeah. And it hit me. I said, that's exactly what he told me. And um, so I went to Sydney. I said, Sid, I'm in the bind. And he said, well, he said, ask for a delay. He said, they owe me that. So I said, okay. When he came up, I said, uh, Mr. President, uh, Jerusalem, I said, I'd like to move to move the zoning petition off for two more weeks. I said, we can have the hearing, but we won't have the vote. And I said that, to the well, how you can? I said, well, I said, Sidney Mathalman is acting mayor today, and he can't participate in it, and he has more life with this project than I do. And I think it's a courtesy to him, we should have his input in this decision-making process. So I move that we delay the vote for two weeks. Prior to that, I went to Mike Early. He said, I could vote for a delay. <laughs> uh, Brian Wagner said, uh, you can change your position. I said, certainly. I said, I think that project is too big. I'm going to vote with you. 
And that was said, if you need me, I'll vote with you. Okay. So when it came up to delay, I won three, two vote to delay. And, and by delaying it, it broke the con uh, contractor's contacts. And then within the two weeks, we extended to four weeks, we sat down and developed a better plan. But we had single family and some townhouses. And it wasn't the best, but it was decent. Okay. So I got that, and that was a tough vote. I mean, I had to use all my political skills to, to get that done. Um, but it's a lesson I never forgot. Now, before you went on the council, you had been uh, with Urban League, right? Right. At St. All, I sat in the role with uh, Paul Boyer yeah. and Hank Braden. Okay. And um, when we finished from school, a couple of years later, and Hank got to work with the Urban League. So Hank recruited Paul to become his assistant on what we call the New Orleans plan. Right. That's where we were integrating the construction trade unions. Right. And um, Paul went to work for him, but the Department of Labor hadn't funded the project. So Clarence Borney borrowed Paul from Hank to do a special project. And Paul worked on the first value classic. It was called the Scholarship, Early Scholarship Classic, I think. Yeah. Um, he got two two small colleges, and he sold tickets along the river, you know, up and down the river from New Orleans to Baton Rouge, and was fairly successful. So Barney kept Paul at the main office. So when Hank, the next year, Hank got the program funded, he went to Paul, he said, well, I'm going to use for my assistant director. So Paul said, why don't we call him? He saw he's in the funeral business. He said, I think if you talk to him, he might, <laughs> he might get him. So uh, at that time, I think the child was paying 14005 and I was making under 10000 with my daddy, you know. So right. uh, I told my dad, I said, I got a chance. He said, well, can you work evenings and weekends? I said, yeah. He said, okay, well, take the job. So I took the job at the Urban League, and uh, the funeral home was my, my backup. Again, politically what happened, by working with the Urban League, it brought me into a nonprofit situation and with labor and management because the New Orleans plan was a, a program that incorporated Labor management. That was Nixon's deal. Started Nick, that's right. It started with the Philadelphia. You remember that. That's right. Yeah. Philadelphia plan. I tell people all the time, Nixon helped us by accident. Yeah. He didn't mean to do it, but it, it worked out that way. Uh, by imposing a plan on the contractors doing business with the federal government, it negatively impacted the unions because contractors could hire people off the street. They didn't right. have to come from the union hall. That was Arthur Fletcher's plan. He was assistant remember secretary. Remember Arthur Fletcher? Yeah. yeah. And um, then they said, well, if you don't like the imposed Philadelphia plan, build your own hometown plan. Okay. So we started the New Orleans hometown plan, the Urban League, TCA, and some other nonprofits. We brought the Associated General Contractors, ABC, all of them to the table, with all the unions in Southeast Louisiana. And we set goals and timetables on when it would take blacks into the right. union. In addition to that, we had a consent decree on three big trades plumbers, electricians, and the sheet metal workers. And um, they were all, business agents were saying, look, I know we got to integrate, but I got to run this year, so can I push it off a year? And I got to do this <laughs> and that. And the sheet metal worker, well, after he got reelected, he went in and signed the consent decree. Okay. And that broke the backs of the plumbers and the electricians. So then we got everybody at the table, and we got 50 jobs a year in the, the two major trades and 25 in sheet metal. Yeah, the big wellness program too at one time. Yeah, we had that, and that came about after we got the plan going. Um, Carter, I think, was president, and um, I forget what was going on, but anyway, they needed welders. So we cut a deal with the Barlamakers Union Hall, and we set up a 24 hour training program, eight hour shifts, and we were training people to become welders, primarily tack welders, you know, just to get into it. Right. And uh, we ran into a problem with mothers on welfare because they were getting a fifty dollar a week stipend, and they had to decide whether they take the stipend or the welfare. So you had women in the program? Yeah, we had women in the program. I didn't know. Yeah, um, and they had to decide whether they take the welfare or take the stipend. It was hard. I mean, it was, it was tough because once you get out the welfare system, you may not be able to get back in. Right. And we couldn't guarantee you a job. Right. It wasn't automatic. So. We lost a lot of good applicants because of that ruling from uh, from the welfare department. Today, I think we could have probably modified it and got it done. Mm -hmm. But we trained um, several thousand people through wow. the union facility over you know ten years or so. And a number of the guys I see on the street now, they thank me.
for getting them in the, in the plumbers union or electricians or what have you, getting them through that process. Some of them became contractors. Because I kept telling them, again, I'm a businessman in a social welfare program, you know, right. and I kept telling the, the, the uh, students, learn the business of your trade. I said, the union's going to teach you the trade, right. but you got to learn the business of it. I said, you may have to go to Delgado or whatever and take some business courses. I said, but if a guy at that time, they were getting eight, nine dollars an hour as first year apprentice, right. up to fifteen and twenty an hour. That's right, minimum wage is about two dollars. That's right. So I said, now, if he can pay you ten dollars an hour, how much money does he make? So you want to learn what he's doing. Learn your trade, but then learn the business of it. And some of them did. I also told them, become a member of the union and go to the meetings. Right. Go to the union halls. I said, they're going to talk about you, but make them talk about you around the corner. Right. Not in the building where you paying dues or you a part of it. I said, go to those meetings and attend it. And, and a lot of them followed our advice. And I think the program was fairly successful. Got a lot of people, some good jobs. And I, I mean, I run into them every now and then somewhere, you know. Right. Um, it phased out around, that started in 71. Around 82, 83, it started phasing out. Um, and I had to leave the Urban League to go to prep out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Lucy Green, um, a white female, very active in Cincinnati. She had a, a Cincinnati hometown plan. Okay. And uh, as the Department of Labor was phasing out hometown plans, they only had like five. New Orleans prep, one in Seattle, one in New York. I forget, one in Alaska. 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 So we had uh, the five of us came together under the prep umbrella. And we got funded for another year or two. And then Steela picked us up for a while after that. But by that time, I was on the city council and I was phasing out of the League, you know. But uh, we did a lot of good. I think all, all the programs around the country under the Urban League, um, uh, Napoleon, uh, Napoleon's name was, he was uh, assistant under Vernon Jordan. And he had the, the national outreach program. And we ran into guys from Little Rock, um, Ernie Green. Ernie Green. So Ernie Secretary Green, of Labor. Yeah, Ernie Green had uh, recruitment and training out of New York. Okay. And um, counterpart to Urban League. But we were all friendly competitors, you know, all going after the Department of Labor contracts. Right. We were all doing the same thing, preparing uh, young students to go into into apprenticeship program. And we got a lot of college dropouts because to get in, you had to pass some tough tests. Okay. And uh, so we would have a tutor and prepare. I mean, little basic things like getting up on time and, right. you know, uh, we, had some, we had some, now we, now that's where I started seeing the real racial problems there because we've had, we had cases where the contractors didn't want to hire them even though they had to, they didn't yeah. want to hire them. In one case we had a, a light-skinned brother with blue eyes. And, Michael Stokes? Uh, and sent, like, like Michael Stokes, and sent him to a uh, contract for a job. He said, I'm so glad they sent you. He said, I'm tired of getting all of them, so and so, you know. Yeah. And the guy took all the information now, I called the Justice Department. I called the union first. I said, you want to do this? Be easy or hard? I said, make it easy, let's get it corrected on. Make it hard, I'm going to call the Justice Department. I said, remember, my lawyers are free. Hmm. So I called the Justice Department, they came down. We took documentation, went back to court, and uh, made it a little bit harder on But then, they, you know, they, they understood and they started taking us in, you know. Did you have any white participants in the program? We had, no, not in our recruitment. Yeah. We had um, some white staff people from okay. the unions. Uh, we had a little problem with the plumbers because when they'd advertised that they'd have these seats open, there were some brothers out of Trinidad uh -huh. who were master pipe fitters because all the refineries and all like that. So one or two heard it. They went over to Union Hall, they had to take them in. So they go back on the phone, call the brothers and uncles, and they start coming in. And the plumber called me up. He said, Lambert, well, what am I supposed to do? I said, well, you can't discriminate. Right. I said, you got to take them in. He said, well, I got about five or six. I said, well, take them in. Well, that goes against my 50. That's not too bad. Then he called back the next week, like 10. I said, oh, time out. <laughs> <laughs> time out. So we got to look at this deal. Somebody so I was supporting your program. Yeah, I said, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to make these trainees, because they were really for journeymen. Yeah. You know, I said, after some years, you make them join. But that's not going to count against my 50, right. my 50 apprentice, you know. So uh, we worked it out. And one time, the, one of the contractors, groups, and unions went to court to say that they were doing so good, they need to be removed from the consent 
decree. So did they need you? They didn't need us anymore. So they put me on the stand. And I said, yes, they've been doing, taking the students on time and doing this and that. He said, well, how long do you think they should be under the consent decree? So I look at the judge, I said, judge, did you really want me to answer that? Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, I think forever. <laughs> I said, you, I'm going to work myself out of job. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if, you don't, if you're not under the consent judge, you don't need me. I said, I think you ought to be under the consent judge forever, you know. So uh, we kept him in there long enough. That was the federal court? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we had federal. Hank was, Hank was the mastermind by getting that involved, getting the, the feds involved. Okay. And um, Hank was a misunderstood politician. He knew the law. He knew uh, politics, you know, um, just a little bit misunderstood in our community. I accepted him for who he was. Yeah, that's right. Hank was Hank. Hank was Hank, that's right. <laughs> Don Hubbard gave him the nickname of Rizzo Tongue. That's what he called it. Yeah, Rizzo Tongue. He always had nicknames for somebody. I, I understand. Yeah. Now, you were uh, at the Urban League when they had the, what was it called, the Black Primary? That was right before. Before me, I think. you? Yeah. Before you? Uh, I got there. I got there in '71. So that was when I the think Larry 60s, was there. Larry Cager. Yeah. Clarence Bonnie was the director, and he had some primaries. I think that's when Dutch was juvenile judge or something. Yeah. He was going to run for. Uh, Dutch had run for, for the uh, state house. No, he already had been in the house. He was going to run for juvenile. council at large. Was it at large? Yeah, because he was in the legislature first. Then he yeah. got to be a juvenile court judge. Right. And then he did, in fact, run. Made the runoff. Uh, for council at large, at the same time that Moon Landry was elected mayor, and then came back years later. But he lost. Yeah, and he stayed on the court. Then, of course, in '78, he right. became became mayor. Yeah. But um, which political organization did you join first? I was in Coop. Okay, so Hank recruited me. When he recruited me to come work for the Urban League, I also had to become a member of Coop. Okay, and I was friendly with the guys, but I wasn't. So even though you were from the Six Ball, you weren't with Tips. No, okay. Tips came afterwards. Okay. Uh, but cool first, but then, then Germany ran for the house right. in Treme, and then he formed Tips. Oh, okay. So it gave him friendly competitors. Okay. Um, and then I was in Cool. Now I knew Sydney, I knew Bob, but I, I didn't. I wasn't involved in the day-to-day -day politics of it right. until I got into Urban League. Okay. And that's when I got involved in the politics, and that's how I got drafted to run for the council seat. Uh, we used to go fishing in the Gulf. Okay. And we'd sit down Saturday morning, plan a little trip for next month. And so we went to the meeting, and Sidney Bartholomew knew that Brad Baggett, who was sitting in District D, was going to take the Public Service Commission seat. Schwagman's father had passed or something. Yeah. And he knew the governor was going to appoint Brad. That would create the vacancy, special election. And uh, he said, we need somebody to run for that seat. I had a big afro and I had <laughs> tinted glasses and the beard because I was busting unions. You know, yeah. I had to look tough. I didn't look like a couldn't look like a Creole from the South Park. I had to look tough. So uh, he said we we're gonna run. So I said we we're gonna run. You know, I said you. I said why me? You got the name. Everybody knows you. You know, got a clean record. Uh, we can raise some money. So what I got to do? I said go to heck out you have your beard. Uh -uh and get you some clear glasses. He said, people want to see the color of your eyes when you're talking to them. So I did all of that. I said, throw my name out there and see what happens. Well, it caught on immediately because I was involved in the six and seven more and part, uh, part of the eight. I mean, that's where our base was politically and my funeral business. I've right. been everywhere. So when I campaigned, when I walked into church, almost every pastor knew me. Mm -hmm. I said, let Lamb come up for me. He's, he's running for the council. Yeah. So automatically I was accepted. And um, the first primary I led almost two to one. Um, we went back afterwards and counted the votes. We couldn't tell who voted. We could tell where they voted from and how many. And in a number of households, five or six votes, nobody showed up. Prominent people. It could be the assumption was that I was going to win. Or at that time, Ku and Dutch had problems. Right. Or I wasn't a Dutch man, I don't know. But a number of people that we knew didn't vote. We couldn't tell who you voted for because that wasn't you voted or not. And then I went into the runoff with um, Frank Muley. Right. His family owned Muley Restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I led two to one in the, in the first. In the second, it was tight. And in the second primary, I tell people this all the time too, 
white Republican, Italian, from Gentilly, beating up on me because Dutch supported me. Cool didn't want me to talk to Dutch, but I said, now I gotta talk to the man. And I went meet with Dutch to ask for his support. And I said, Dutch, all I want to do is represent District D, just right here. He said, yeah, man, what he said, and after you hear, you're going to want my job. I said, Dutch, I don't want your job. <laughs> he said, you're going to want it, you know, so uh, he, he agreed to endorse me. And my opponent, Muley, seized on that and said I was going to be soft on crime with the mayor's support. Right. And he was going to beat me up on crime. Well, he had a black guy supporting him, a guy named Bobby Reader. Yeah. Bobby had a terrible record. He had committed all kinds of crimes and stuff, so my PR people put together a piece, black and white piece, where you open them and say, Frank Mueller is so tough on crime, let's look at his support. <laughs> open up Bobby Reed, front and center, number across the chest, <laughs> all the crimes he committed. 50,000 flies. I said, I'm not putting that out. I said, whatever the guy did, he served his time, he's clean, now I'm not going to beat up on him. Right. I said, why? I'm not running against him. I'm running against Mueller. And Mueller, his brother, was in jail for shooting somebody. He was with the Dixie Mafia. Mm. I said, why don't you do a fly on him? Yeah. Don't, I'm not going to hit the brother, you know? So I said, throw the flyers away. They threw them away. But the night of the election, I'm leading by 1,550 votes. Five precincts were out in Gentilly behind the old economical police yeah. on Gentilly and yeah. Major Field. One in the ninth ward. When those five precincts came in, my vote lead went from 1550 to 37. I said, did you put the fly out? <laughs> they said, you told us not to put it out. I said, y'all the campaign, man. Y'all supposed to do what you're supposed to do. Don't listen to me. I'm the candidate. But what saved me was the precinct in the ninth ward came in. Okay. And I won by 200 and some votes. So I won, a, I won by 258 votes. But it was close. And I tell people all the time, sometimes you can't let your civil rights get involved with your politics. Because by right, politically, I should have hit the guy, which meant I'd have, I either share votes off of me or He was hitting you, huh? Yeah, but I didn't want to hit him, yeah. you know? But that's why I could have lost a race, because I'm being socially conscious, I guess, instead of being a good politician. And your election tilted the majority to the majority of black. Yeah. I wrote an article about that. Yeah, so when I got on in D. But, um, and I stayed there for 13 years. And uh, I learned, I tell people all the time, I learned more because of Dutch. Mm -hmm. With Dutch, you had to be right. You couldn't halfway be right. If you were not right, he'd call you out. Mm -hmm. So it made, it made me learn the system. I had to be very careful what I said and what I did, because if I offended him, he'd jump on me. So I had to you know, make sure I was right when I did that. It was easy to offend him anyway. Oh, yeah, you look at the wrong way. But, um, and, you know, Dutch ran against me. I remember. Yeah, and um, I knew I couldn't debate him. He was a trial lawyer, you know, learned counsel, so I wouldn't try to debate him. I'd let him talk. Yeah. And he talked 15, 20 minutes. And then I'd get up and I'd say, with all due respect to the mayor, if he didn't fit, feel like pothole in your street in the last eight years as mayor, He's not going to feel it now. He didn't turn that tree branch that you've been fighting for last year. He's not going to do it. And I'd walk away, get out of that. And I won by 191 votes, something like that. At least I led. I knew it was a suck. I led by 191. Yeah. And then Dutch got out. Right. So he didn't, I didn't defeat him. I don't think his heart was that way in that. No, I, he was doing it for the wrong reasons, I think. And Mur you remember Murray McGee? I, I remember Murray McGee telling him that he was... The only person she knew who was angry when he won. Yeah. That he was a bad winner. A bad winner, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, she called and told him. She called me Little Lambert because she knew him from the funeral business. Right. She said, Little Lambert, you're going to win this race. She said, You know, we're the Baptist church. We want our deacons and our pastors to move up. Yeah. We don't want them to step back. Right. Now, Matt, a Dutch is our man. We don't want him on the council. We want him to move forward. Yeah. So we're going to be with you. Right. And uh, we're not going to let that happen. And I, was, I managed to win 191 votes, and I, I gave him more money, yeah. a lot of money and everything else. But um, he, taught, he taught us a lot right. by being the way he was. Um, and he, like you say, anything would upset him. I remember one time our city council attorney was the mayor's city attorney. I mean, he came out the same office. And uh, the guy was, 
explain them. Exemplo, right? Well, Exemplo was the chief, but one of the assistants oh, okay. they put on the council for us. Okay. And um, he refused to answer Johnny Jackson's question. He said he didn't have an opinion. And I said, Johnny, said, we yield to the floor to me. He said, yes. I said, Mr. City Attorney, I understand you, you don't have an opinion. He said, I don't. I said, well, if, I, if I'm right, I think that's all you have is an opinion. <laughs> no word. I said, so, I said, so you want to you wanna change that? And say, instead of saying you don't have an opinion, you want to say that you have an opinion, but it might be in conflict with the administration. Okay. Well, when I said that, Dutch came running out the back row. Because he used to listen to Yeah, he used to listen to it every council meeting. You know? yeah. can I, let me tell you something, mister. You better watch yourself. I said, Dutch, I'm not talking to you. You're talking to your city attorney, you know. Yeah. And uh, we got, I mean, even though there was some political tension, yeah. he and I had a good relationship. Sure. And uh, I helped him when he didn't need to get his pay raise. I mean, nobody wanted to give him a raise. I said, he's the man, you know. Right. Ron Farmer was making more money than the man. That's right. crazy, you know. And um, I sat down with him and worked it out. I said, Dutch, I think I got the votes to get you bread. What about next year? I said, hold <laughs> up, Dutch. Let's get one at a time. So we did it on the anniversary, like on the anniversary automatically get a 5%. Right. And so I got that through with him, helping him with his zoning issue yes, he had in his neighborhood. Uh, he had ex Jerusalem. And when I saw it on the agenda. I said, Chief, what you doing? He said, man, I don't know. He said, the little man asked me to do it. You called him a little bit. I said, well, I'll handle that. He said, would you? I said, yeah. I said, I'll go see Dutch. So I went and see him, understood what the problem was, and I handled the zoning issue for him. And we were both, well, we were friends before yeah. politics. I knew him from the funeral business. His, his law firm was at the Peter Clayford building on Orleans, and he and Mud Truett on all those guys. Right. You know, and I'd go to get death certificates and uh, notarize and insurance papers and all. Right. And I remember him telling me one day at the Roosevelt Hotel, it's either Urban League dinner or something. He said, I'm going to run for man. He said, I'm going to win. He said, you want to bet? I said, Dutch, I'm not a betting man. He said, I'm going to win. I said, well, good luck to you. He well, he called me for lunch. I remember two years before he ran and said, if I run for mayor, will you support me? I say, you think you can win? Say, so I tell you what, if I run, it's because I think I can win. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. He was pretty sure. Oh, he was sure. And he knew who he had to run against. Yeah. He had to run against Joe DeRosa. And beat him. And he, and he, you know, he pointed him out, like Ali used to do. I want you, Joe. Want, so the, the contest was between he and Joe. Right. All the guys in the middle got lost. Tony Morrison and uh, Matt Kiefer. And in our, in our organization, we had Dutch people, Kiefer people, and Morrison people. And I was with the Morrison group. Harold and we'll is he still living? Chap. Tony I mean, Morrison. To, no, Tony died. Yeah. Tony his died. wife is still here. And his, his daughter. Okay. Um, and Sydney and Neville, I think, were with Dutch. Okay. And we had a couple of rounds of votes. And, uh, well, I was with the Braden group. The Braden was against Dutch? That's a family matter. I know. And it brought it into politics. Yeah. The Bradens and uh, Morels and the Hydells and all that. Was, they both married the Hydell family. So it was their family feud that carried it into politics. But after a couple of votes, then we all agreed to go with Dutch. And uh, Dutch asked for all the names of our guys who work in the city hall, and he fired all of them. When he won, he fired all of them. So, I remember he went after the Cedar people. I never yeah. could understand that. And it was a federal program. Yeah. NOPD had nothing to do with nothing that. Nothing to do with it. And uh, he was trying to embarrass Ku, I think. Why? Well, Ku was the only group that would challenge him when he ran for third term. Ku well, there were a lot of innocent people who had nothing, had to, nothing do to do with that. My yeah. son was a. I think seven, eight years old, he used to go to that program. Yeah, he had all the, the teachers like the rap program. Harold oh, yeah. Montgomery. Yeah. Remember Harold Montgomery? And right. Tony Molina. Tony, Tony passed Molina. away a couple of years ago. Harold's in the nursing home. No, we could figure that out. Yeah, he just, Dutch was just a political animal in a sense, and he knew if he could damage cool, if he got us out the way, he could almost do what he wanted. Yeah. And he didn't want Sidney to be mayor, but uh, Sidney was able to, to become mayor. What was that about? I think, that well, feud? Braden, and then I think Dutch was so combative, yeah. and Sidney wasn't. Right. I think he figured Sidney was going to be too weak as a mayor, right. and he just didn't want to see it happen. Well, to begin with, he didn't want to not be mayor. Right, because he tried yeah, twice. He tried uh, twice. Unlimited and Roshan, turns, and then just three. Roshan was, um, was with Dutch. Yeah, he was. The and after Dutch CEO. lost, when he lost the third term, Roach went to him and said, you know, Dutch, I think I might run for mayor since you can. Yeah. And he said, I'm not through. 
And that's what he went for. We went for unlimited terms first. Right. And, and then, then just three. Third term. And after that, that's when Motion <clears throat> started helping Sydney. He left Dutch and went and worked for Sydney for the mass race. And in that, that's when Dutch ran against me. And in that race, I used Rochon. Rochon was a, an accountant, so he knew the numbers. Right. And um, I used his formula to show that I could win. And um, the district was about 65% black, 35% white. And my poll showed that Dutch was getting 4% white vote. Okay. I said, well, I'm going to give him 10. So I took 90% of 35. All I needed was 30% of 65 to win. Right. Dutch was pulling 65% in the black community. We had to get 70. So I said, well, I got my 30 and I got my 90. I can win. So I went to Roach. I said, Roach, give me some of that money you're using for Sydney. Help me beat Dutch, and then I can help you all in a second. He said, no, little man, it's the other way around. We'll help you. If, if Dutch doesn't beat you in the first, <laughs> we'll help you in the second. You right. know? I said, well, I don't want you win in the first. I said, Dutch can't win in the first. I can't. It wouldn't help him. He came close to winning. He came close. Yeah. That I they only won by 191. Yeah. Now, uh, Roach was with Seoul, wasn't he? Kind of. Yeah, he was closer to, to Don and Sherman. I don't think he was... He was actually a member of Soul or not? I don't know. Well, he was not a member of Cool. No, he wasn't a member of Cool. <laughs> but he helped Sydney for mayor. <clears throat> okay. And um, Dutch had one of the best CAOs, Rochon, and one of the best city attorneys, with Salen mm -hmm. Um Roche knew the numbers, knew the budgets, and he knew how to handle us on the council. Uh, he knew the politics of his office. Um, Sal knew the law, knew the legislature, and he knew how to give opinions that would hold long enough. Because if he didn't, you'd have to challenge him. And mm -hmm. very few people challenge the city attorney's opinion. So he'd write opinions that would give Dutch just what he wanted without going too far over. Right. But enough that we'd have to say, oh, we gotta sue him, you know, and then we wouldn't do it. I said, Sal, you got one of the best opinions. I said, it's like adding instant add water to it, you know, you get an instant opinion of him. But he was always right on the line. And uh, he, he, I mean, those two guys really helped Dutch mm -hmm. in his eight years as a man. They were really good. Again, I learned from both of them, too. One of your tough votes was the Mardi Gras ordinance? Yeah, that was a tough one with Dorothy. Um, we didn't know where that was coming from when, okay. uh, when she brought that up. Um, Had she consulted with you before? No. Um, and when it happened, looking at it, the, the, the Mardi Gras uh, parades and all didn't really cost the city money. It brought money in because of Mardi Gras. So when she was saying, well, you know, using our streets for free and this and that, I said, well, in a way they're not because it helps the economy of the city and all. So we're kind of on the fence. We knew it was something we needed to do. We were trying right. to figure the best way to get it done. Right. And I remember being called to a meeting over at the Energy Center across from City Hall, me and Jeruso. We met with um, the kings of the crews and the members of the Louisiana Club and the Boston Club and all that. And I just remember about 80 old white males. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying to myself, I thought I met everybody white in this town. <laughs> you know, where these guys come from, you know? But they were old, coupon clippers. They go to lunch and go back home, you know? And they just were concerned about losing their crews and all of that. And while we were talking with them, Sydney was meeting with uh, Charbonnet from Rex, the white Charbonnet, right. and uh, other people. And they worked out a compromise, got Dory to agree to it. So we didn't have to, it, it took the pressure off of us. Right. And they worked out a good compromise. And, and it worked out well. Pretty much. Pretty much. Because most of the crew was now pretty thoroughly integrated. Yeah, nobody wanted to get in the race. And yeah, nobody wanted to get in Rex. I mean, I went to one Rex ball when I first got on the council because I thought I had to. Yeah. And after that, I said, oh, I'm not going to this anymore. But, you know? but they're integrated now, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they, 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 they're taking a few in right away. Right. But uh, for the most part, we didn't want to be a member of their crews. Yeah. But that's where the business was being handled. I know it helped Jewish. Yeah. That's why you know, when they go to lunch and it, they cut the deals at lunch. Right. You know, if you're not a member, you're not going to. Pick with club. Yeah. Like I told the guys in the union, go to the union or make them, make them talk somewhere else. You know, they, they don't want to talk in front of you. Well, if we couldn't get in the club, we'd never know what was going on. Right. So that was the real 
purpose was to integrate it for business purposes, not just for the socializing. But for socializing, you wouldn't want to be a member of those clubs. But uh, it worked out on the end, it worked out to be a fair deal. What do you think was your biggest accomplishment on the council? I think the zoning issues, that's where I, we were more importantly involved. I mean, that was a district. I mean, anything yeah. citywide? That citywide, um, I can't remember. It, well, most of it was projects, you know, the world's fair stuff. And okay. Economic development. Um, some of the proposals, convention center, all that was part of it. Um, a lot of things we didn't get done. I wanted to find another way of doing our streets and, and neighborhood stuff. Couldn't like that what? Done. Well, I, I think people who vote for taxes if they know it's going to be spent in their neighborhood. Okay. So I always, <coughs> Dutch, Dutch was working on that at one time, but he was doing it by precincts. Uh, and he was precinct captains, which in essence looked like a political army he was trying to create. My thing was create districts that would have to be large enough to generate the revenues to flow to bonds, which means that the boundaries would have to expand, which would include black and white neighborhoods, rich and poor. Right. You couldn't, you couldn't just go down St. Charles Avenue You'd have to go four blocks, five blocks on either side. In that case, you're bringing in low income too. Right. Uh, and create taxing districts and then develop what the needs were in each district. Some needed streets, some didn't. Some might just want beautification. So the taxes that were generated would go back to solve that problem. And a percentage of it would go to help those that were not incorporated. So that eventually everybody would be in some district, but it would ensure that the taxes you're paying now would be spent in your neighborhood. Right now, it goes into the general fund. So there is no comprehensive plan for maintaining streets? There is, but it's not funded necessarily by neighborhoods. Okay. It may be funded politically, who puts the most pressure on somebody. I yeah. thought the district councilman controlled that. No, you don't really control it. You have some influence, but not a lot. Okay. And depending on how you stand with the mayor, would determine how fast they get to work on it. Okay. Uh, but I thought if you spent it in your neighborhood, you might you might want to support it. Okay. And again, as I said, certain neighborhoods need certain um, needs. Right now, everybody needs streets because the, the, the flood destroyed all the streets in the city. Oh, yeah. You know, and I think people will support a tax if they knew it was going to pay their street, you know, um, and drainage and what have you. But uh, now with FEMA money, they're going to get a chance to kind of touch all neighbors. But I still think it's something to consider. Years ago, it would have been considered a racially divided thing because they said the rich would take care of themselves and the poor wouldn't. But your boundaries would have to be so large that you, you wouldn't have that problem. That's the people in Louisiana. <laughs> right. And you see, part of, part of my thinking came from the fact that uptown New Orleans always had drainage problems. Oh, Lord. So whenever I went to Sewage Water Board for something, they said, well, we got to take care of District B. And I said, wait a minute. Jim can't get all that money. Give me my one-fifth. <laughs> you know? I said, why don't you give me money for my district? And I said, why don't we all have money for it? Then we can decide. We're closest to the people. Yeah. When they, they call us first, then they call it large, and then they call it mad. So if they gave it to us by districts, and that's when Dutch was right, I wanted to be mad. So it'd be mad district D. Because <laughs> so, I knew what, what my people in my district wanted. Right. And um, you'd, you'd have to fight to try and get that delivered. But um, I think for the most part, I had. Pleasant time on the council, uh, just tough Thursdays, mostly because of Dutch, but again, it was a learning process. What about uh, your relationship with his son, Mark? Oh. That worked out. Uh, initially, it was a little tough. Um, when he decided, when I ran for mayor in 94, me, Ken Carter, um, Donald Mintz, Mark, Sherman Copeland, and Mitch Landrieu got in. A rumor had it that Somebody got Ken in a race to divide the vote between uh, me and Mitch, so me, Ken, and Mitch would go out the same vote, and that would leave Donald with his share and Mark with his share. Okay. But uh, I, went, I went meet with Mark, and I said, look, um, I understand you might run for mayor. I already declared I was going to run. He said, I'm thinking about it because I don't want Donald Mintz to win, and right now Donald would beat you or Ken. I said, well, I think if we got in a runoff, we'd all rally around one of us and we'd beat Donald. He said, I don't want to take the chance. So when he declared he was running, it threw all the numbers off. Well, at first they were speculating that his mother was going to run. That's right. So we, if he, any Morial got the race, the numbers were going to, all the numbers were able to throw all of them away. So when he got in, I couldn't, I could have run for at large, but I already promised the guys running for at large I wasn't. Right. So I didn't want to 
go back on my word. Today, you, you do that. They, they don't care about a word now. But once I gave the guys my word, I wasn't going to run. I didn't want to do that. Um, so Mark and I got along, and I helped him in the second to beat Donald. Okay. And then afterwards, um, when the Senate race came up, I went to Mark and I said, I've got something we can make peace over. I said, I want to run for the state Senate. He said, I can't be with you. He said, after what y'all did, my dad, I said, no, what your daddy did us. I said, I said, I'm talking about history. I said, but uh, I said, I understand you. He said, I got my own candidate and all of that. I said, well, if you play poker, you know what all in is? I said, I'm all in. Yeah. So we'll just go toe to toe. And that's when he ran Herbert Kidd against me for the Senate. And um, I was happy with that. He was candidate. in the class, wasn't he? Yeah, I was happy with that candidate because he was as old as me, as fat as me. And I know you couldn't out campaign <laughs> me, you know. So uh, I told him, I said, you know, uh, we're going to sue you over your residence. Because he was living in Algiers where he was voting from his mother's house. And um, they had gone to court in that August and got uh, declaratory judgment that he could run from his mother's house. But when he qualified, I sued anyway. And even though he won the lawsuit, he was losing politically. Every time we brought up the question of residence, it was a whole story about where he lived, where his mother lived, and all that. And um, the attorney handled my case for me and said, man, I lost. I said, no, you didn't lose. Because I didn't really want to bump her, but out the race. Yeah. I wanted him in. I didn't want to, because he might get spotted younger. And then I'd really be in trouble, you know? So we, we wanted him to stay in there. We didn't file suit till five o'clock that evening. So, so he uh, stayed in the race, but he didn't make that an issue. That's right. And then I found out he hadn't paid his property taxes. Ah. So I came back and hit him with the taxes. And that one two punch was enough to, to knock him out. And I won the Senate race. Um, and I told him all I said, I'm, I want him to be friends. There's no sense in fighting over this foolishness. And we got along fine. So Matter of fact, I even got a Urban League award from Mark. So you actually supported him? I from the legislature. Him. I supported, yeah, and I supported uh, Herbert when he ran for judge. Right. We, um, we got back together. I've, I've never been a sore winner, yeah. you know, and uh, in politics, you got to remember, what I think Bob Collins said, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, you know. Uh, and it's a game we play in a sense, and when it's over, but you move to the next, the next level. Well, you were in the legislature. Which governors did you have the I best had, relationship um, with? I had... Foster. Now, in that case, what happened there, Mark was with uh, Kid, okay. and uh, which were trial lawyers and unions, and which was hard for me because I was always supported by the unions. But uh, I went to Foster because he helped me raise money because he didn't want a trial lawyer in it. So um, I had a good relationship with, with Foster, and later on got to be chairman of a committee, a second year in office, mm -hmm. which is kind of unheard of. Uh, and then I got one term with him, and then on the blank call, I served a couple of years. And then I went to, um, my son went to Public Service Commission. Right. And I came back to be constable and came back home. But uh, I had a good relationship with Foster um, and the Republicans. Okay. Because they were all chairmen, and I was one of them. They gave us five black chairs myself, Tarver, C.D. Jones. Um, so you were acting with the Black Hawkers? Yeah. Okay. CD and Cleo and all of us, and the race with Cleo, I, I mean, I hated to run against Cleo, but when I put my son in the Public Service Commission, so he got to run against Cleo. But I had a good relationship with the guys in the, in the Black Caucus and with the administration. Um, a white lawyer said something, I guess it's a compliment. He said, Lambert goes out of his way to make sure there's no problems. Well, that's good. He, he goes out of his way not to have an enemy, you know. And that's usually the way I work. I, I, I always thought there was a solution to every problem. We just had to find it. Did know? you have much relationship with the uh, Nagin administration? Very little. Very little. He didn't want it. When you go to him to try and help him, he didn't want it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. It was originally from your neighbor, old neighborhood. Yeah, he wouldn't listen to You didn't know his family? I knew a little, little bit of him. Yeah. And I got our group to support him. He was a Peter Claver also boy. Yeah, he, um, when he ran, um, Paul, I was with Paul at Irons. Okay. For mayor. And when she got knocked out, then uh, he supported Megan. And she told me, she said, man, there's something about him I just can't feel. I said, well, I think he's going to win. Yeah. And we supported him. And we offered to do whatever we wanted for him, but he never called on. He wouldn't take advice or nothing. Mm -hmm. He just ignored it, you know. Well, Mitch is like that, too. Okay. Mitch, you can't give Mitch any advice. Very different from his dad. Totally different. Yeah. Totally different.
instead of bringing in neighborhood people, he tried to pull them out. You know, he wants to do all the things on his own, and um, I find it difficult to find people who like him. Well, he's may try to get the third turn. Uh, got to have people if you're going to do that. Yeah, well, we'll be ready. <laughs> <laughs> if they didn't give it to Dutch, they ain't gonna give it to him. They give it to Chuck Morris. That's right. So I don't know why he thinks he would get it. You know, it would be a good campaign to work against. What is your opinion about the future of the city as we near the tricentennial? Well, I think we still got so much to be done. Um, we've taken care of what, what the city is known for, the French Quarter, the CBD area, the uptown, all of that's well done. But our older neighborhoods are just going down yeah. and going down real fast. Yeah. We're not paying enough attention to it. We're not doing enough to keep people here in the city. We get a lot of new people in. Uh, we haven't done enough to bring back the ones who were displaced because of the storm. Uh, I think there's a lot more that has to be done. But for the outside, the image of the city will look good and everything will be fine. But uh, we've got major problems. Um, my rule of thumb on how we're making out with race relations is that little piece in the picky unit on Sunday where they put the little one-inch pictures of the people who moved up in business. Mm -hmm. If you look at that, very few black faces, and when you do find them, either working for outreach for a bank, or a United Fund, or Urban League. So you're saying you obligatory see, too? You don't see them in, uh, in big major business positions, you know. Uh, we don't have a lot of CEOs of corporations in New Orleans. And our economy is primarily on low income people. Yeah, no service or service area. So I think we got a long ways to go. Well, your old district particularly has been ravaged. A lot of people have good homes, but the neighborhoods just crime and come infected. Back. And New Orleans East, where the doctors and all, they, they all got better position. They left you, and they're coming back, and you got a hospital that you don't have people to service it. You're going to have a major problem with that hospital in the East because of the money. It's, there's not enough people using it. And uh, it's things like that that we didn't quite tend to. Um, we lost four years with Nagin, you know, right after the storm. Um, and Mitch has done a lot of surface kind of stuff. To me, he hasn't done what needed to be done. Uh, we didn't recruit any big businesses here since then, which would be difficult for a large manufacturing company to come in. Why would you go locate an area that's uh, hurricane prone and could be knocked out for a weekend or months or years, you know? Yeah. So you're not going to recruit big business. That's part of the reason why we voted for the casinos, because that was the only industry we could get for nothing. Do you think that's been a success? I think so. And I think it's helped save um, that part of the city, the downtown, French Quarter, convention center, it kind of all fits in there. That was not my, I would not have put it there, but um, I wanted to put it where City Hall is. And, really? Yeah, where Duncan Plaza is, and put City Hall where Hyperville is. Tied it with Armstrong Park, mm. almost like what he did with in Copenhagen. With um, well, uh, that's what Sidney said. That was one of the things that he wanted to do, but yeah. he got no support for it. Couldn't get support for it. But I wanted to put City Hall in with Armstrong Park, tied into City Hall, and um, the park and the and tied into the French Quarter. And I looked at it as a, like a shopping center in a sense. You had the Riverfront, Padres, Cleveland, Esplanade. That's your, your district. Well, they put it because it was close to the French Quarter. You put it, Duncan Plaza, then we're a long ways from where. Yeah, well, they, they put it there because they had a, that antique, that uh, old um, convention center. Right. Uh, I forget what, was, what we call River it. Gate. River Gate. River uh, And it, again, they're, they're thinking, CBD people, say the quarter. Yeah. And convention center. My thing is help everybody. Right. And as I saw it, putting City Hall in Treme. With a cure of that problem, you had the riverfront was clean. Okay. Party Street was in good shape. It's Cleveland going to Esplanade that's weak. Well, by putting City Hall in Armstrong Park, you anchor Treme. Then you take where City Hall is a valuable piece of property. Government ought not be there. It should be somewhere that's less valuable. That's where you put your casino and put hotels on each corner, tied into the casino and tied into the Superdome. We needed hotel rooms. And if we're going to go in the game and you need people. So by putting the casino tied in with the Superdome, you have all indoor sports arena at all times, but overhead walkways, it, it, it was just a perfect fit. 
I went back to Tulane, you know, to get my executive MBA. I remember that. And um, <clears throat> it was one of the few high passes I made was on that that uh, scenario. And I used the numbers from the gaming, hotel industry in order to support the concept. We would have had a brand new city hall, we would have cleaned up Tremé, um, we would have anchored the quad. I was like Yellow Brick Road from City Hall to Cafe Des Moines, you know, and just tie the whole downtown, make it bigger in a sense, and, and anchor it, really anchor it. But I couldn't get anybody to pay attention well, to it. I was going to say, who, who made that decision? It was, like, it was a council decision or a state decision? It was a combination of the business council, the mayor's office, you know. I kept, kept telling them and they wouldn't listen to me. And I went to City Hall, but to mayor on the City Hall concept, who was City Hall on Armstrong Park. He said, I can't get money for that. Yeah. He said, can you put me in an arena or something? So I turned to the guy, I said, he ain't draw it in an arena. So we took and put the arena in the green space, Duncan Plaza, and went meet with Edwards, because they were taking the hotel motel tax. They were giving it to Jefferson Parish and everybody. Well, that's Zephyr's Field. Yeah, so he said, what about New Orleans? So he said, I'll do the arena, but I can't do it on city property, I'll do it on state. And that's when they put it down in the Superdome. Right. So we did get the arena built, but that killed the city hall concept because he couldn't do two things. Uh, I wanted Hamilton to do the, the city hall, and I think that would, at that time, maybe fifty or sixty million dollars could have put a new city hall up. And um, you would have had enough parking. Well, you had more parking. You had all the feet. You had. Yeah. Oh, you could. As a matter of fact, I even envisioned putting two, three-story buildings for sewage and water board, health department, just make like a whole governmental complex in Tremé. That would have anchored Tremé. Yeah. You know, it would have been perfect, and it would, it would cure the problems in the quarter. Yeah. Um, but again, that was my business approach, and nobody listened to me, you know. Um, and it's difficult where it is, the, the casino's doing well, but across from the Superdome, I think it would have been better. You got better circulation of traffic, you can get people in and out, you know, you, every event in the Dome, you could have more events in the Dome. Okay. Um, and you can get people in and out a lot better. But it's stuck against the real during certain times of the year, Mardi Gras, Christmas time, or it's, it's jammed, it's, it's real tight. Matter of fact, parking is a problem. Right. Even now with the valet parking, if you're not a, a regular gambler, you pay $20 an hour to park down there, you know. So the average guy's not gonna go down there. It, it, it really made it a tourist trap more than anything else. But- um, And a lot of tourists are not coming here to gamble. That's right. But they, they're catching kind of walking <laughs> through. Yeah. Now, Hamilton's plan was a little bit better because he had envisioned putting a theater on that parking lot next to Canal I Place. That. And he'd have to go through the casino to enter the theater. So he would have, like, um, the Grammys. Every star would have a night in that theater. So you two or 3,000 people come see their favorite star. They'd have to go through the casino to get in there. You know, underground, you know, uh, passageway. Uh, he knew how to bring people, move people. He was not a gambler, he was a developer. Uh, he had an idea of putting a water um, screen where you could show moves and stuff off a of, uh, water slide and uh, like an outside arena around the casino where you could, 2,000 people a night could come see a water show, 20, 30 minute show. That was to get people downtown, get them near the casino. But the state decided to go with um, with Harris and bumped him out. But it was his vision. Of yeah, I, remember, I remember that now that you mentioned it. And um, all that got bumped out because of because of politics. Any last word? I uh, had a good run. Okay. Uh, I think there's a lot of things I could have done better, you know, and I'd like to go back. I guess you always figure you can't, can't, go, back. You can't go back. Yeah. Uh, I wish I'd paid a little bit more attention to some stuff politically. And um, even though I didn't win the mass race, we had said, man, you know, cause that's a hard job. You're not too old yeah. now, are you? Oh, I'm too old, man. I'm 73 now. Okay. Yeah. I got, I got new tennis, but I ain't ready to run. <laughs> I hear you. But uh, I'd like to revisit some things again, you know, and uh, maybe do things a little bit differently. But I, and for the most part, I think I had a good run and never got in any trouble politically, you know. And I did some good for people. Nothing on a major scale, but I think individually. I helped as many people as I could. And that's part because, of, as I said, I came up in a business way. You help people. And even now, I help people. Uh, oh, you're still active in the funeral business? No, my brother is. Uh, we lost our place to a fight in 89, and Bernard went over to Abad, and eventually he's over to Charbonnet now. Okay, I saw and that. he's happy. 
I mean, I got the vegan one in front of me. I got to figure out what to do with it. You're looking at putting some I just saw like a few hundred covers for yeah. a few months ago. Yeah. And uh, so it, it worked out all right. I, I guess I didn't set out to be a politician, you know. It fell that way. I didn't set out to be a teacher. Yeah, it just fell that way. Yeah, yeah. We had a good time. Thank you Thank, very much. Enjoyed it all. I Thank enjoyed you. it too. I learned a lot. I hope you got some good stuff. Oh, we got a lot of good stuff.